Andreas, you can you can start sharing your presentation. Okay. And uh, let me say that you are a senior researcher at the University of Bologna at the Department of Industrial Chemistry. You are an expert in electrochemical biosensing, biomarkers in imaging, and 3D printing, among, uh, I mean, all the different topics that you are uh, investigating. Uh, the title of your presentation is uh, Electrochemical Detection of a Viable Bacteria and Biofilm. Yes. Just let me know if you can you can see the presentation in presentation mode. Yes, I will. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for the invitation to give a contribution to this uh, Substantia uh, online event. So, uh, yeah, as already mentioned, I am a senior assistant professor at the University of Bologna since uh, two and a half years. Before I have worked six years as a postdoc and scientist at the EPFL in, uh, in Switzerland. And actually I'm German, I made my PhD in, uh, in 2012 in, uh, in Germany. So I am an electrochemist in analytical chemistry. So I basically work on the, on the uh, development, fabrication and application of um, electrochemical uh, biosensors and for the presentation today I selected um, recent works on the detection of uh, bacterial infections and um, antimicrobial resistance and biofilms. So the, the presentation is divided into two parts. So the first one is the work on point of care electrochemical detection of uh, bacteria and antimicrobial resistance and then the second part relates to the study of biofilms and how they respond to, to antimicrobial agents using electrochemical imaging techniques. Okay, the, the work I am presenting uh, was obtained in international collaborations. So I would uh, just like to mention the most important uh, contributions, which was actually um, the group of uh, Professor Hubert Giroux at the EPFL in, in Switzerland and colleagues. And um, another uh, contribution is from Professor Greg Swain from the Michigan State University in the, in the US. Okay, antimicrobial resistance. I think everyone is, um, is more or less aware of it or has heard about it. It's um, related to the fact that uh, not only bacteria, but also viruses and, and fungi um, developed over the years and uh, exposed to antibiotics, a resistance against these antimicrobial treatments, so that over the times many antibiotics became ineffective, which is a risk for the individual person, but also for the society uh, over long terms if the antibiotics do not become any more um, effective. So basically, uh, if you want to see it very black, we could go back in the, in the Middle Ages where we were uh, completely without antimicrobial uh, protection. So one of the reasons that this situation has developed is actually that over many years there was an overprescription of antibiotics, um, even not knowing if a patient uh, had a bacterial infection, was feeling sick. So a medician very often decided to prescribe antibiotics to be on the safe side. But the more bacteria are uh, exposed to antibiotics, the higher are the chances that they develop and increase their antimicrobial resistance abilities and that's actually what happens it's known since 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 many years and the actions have already taken to reduce this to only prescribe antibiotics when it's really necessary but this requires um, detection methods of bacterial infections and of uh, antimicrobial resistance and a lot of research is going on there also and it's uh, for the detection part okay and uh, another important point is that uh, once um, there is a bacterial infection in the blood, for example, so bloodstream infection, they can become uh, very dangerous in very, very short time. So uh, actions have to be taken uh, rapidly and also decisions for prescription of antibiotics have to be made very quickly. So um, as already mentioned, many actions are already in place. However, if we compare the numbers of um, 
persons that died related to an M uh, AMR, uh, it's estimated to be around 700,000 uh, nowadays. However, if no further actions or if no efficient actions would uh, be taken, the number could uh, exceed 10 million in 2050, and this would actually overcome, for example, the number of uh, people dying um, by cancer today. So it is a, it is a serious threat. Um, and actually, although actions have been taken, it became a new concern during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, especially during the last year when not much was known about uh, COVID-19 uh, disease, so the disease that was affected by the, by the coronavirus SARS-CoV-2. So there was always, and there is still a question um, about, as part of the viral infection with the coronavirus, is there a bacterial co-infection? And uh, as also here, in many cases, the decision by a medician to prescribe an antibiotic is very often quite clear to prescribe in order to, to save the, the patient. And um, so that by prescribing again, a larger number of uh, antibiotics increases the chances that bacteria develop the, the AMR. And uh, this further continues with new uh, coronavirus mutations and um, it's actually something that is uh, discussed in the literature but not much is known as the pandemic is uh, on the uh, let's say relatively uh, new phenomena that uh, we are dealing with as everyone knows but it's a fact that it has been uh, reported that for example uh, in COVID-19 patients uh, elevated c-reactive protein level has been detected which is basically only known um, for bacterial infections, but not for viral. But it was recorded in COVID-19 patients. Um, and without microbial confirmation, um, antibiotics then were uh, prescribed, um, but there was no bacterial infection. And actually also nowadays, the situation is more clear. So in hospitalized COVID-19 patients, actually only six to 8% of the patients had the bacterial co uh, infection. But, of course, there is still a lack of uh, comprehensive understanding of these bacterial co-infections. So, again, that uh, the decision to prescribe antibiotics is, uh, is still, um, still existing. In order to uh, understand whether bacteria are resistant or susceptible to antibiotics, uh, we perform antimicrobial susceptibility testing. So, basically, you culture bacterial cells in the presence of one or different types of antibiotics in different concentrations over a certain amount of time. If bacteria don't grow, so they don't multiply, um, the bacteria is susceptible to the antibiotic, so the antibiotic is efficient, is effective. However, if there is a resistance, the bacteria will grow, so that many detection methods are related to identifying the growth of, uh, of bacteria in presence of the, of the antibiotics. There are two types. Uh, main types of testing. One is phenotypic testing, which is the gold standard. So here you actually uh, observe the growth visually of, uh, of bacterial mass. Uh, you can see it by eyes on, on uh, culture plates, or you can see it in liquid volumes by the turbidity that is uh, increased with the increasing number of bacteria in the sample. There is also mass spectrometry techniques nowadays that are looking for resistant uh, correlated proteins. More and more into the focus get uh, genotypic testing, but however, it's still far from the clinical applications. Many research and development is going on in, in that field. Um, they can be very powerful and very uh, sensitive based on PCR or whole genome sequencing. Uh, however, to develop this in a stage that it can be applied clinically uh, for a broad range of, uh, of bacteria, um, it's still not reached that case. So most of the the, the techniques follow the phenotypic testing. One general problem for uh, bacteria detection is that the concentration of bacteria in blood is extremely low. So it's, it's much lower than 100 colony forming uh, units. And the limit of detection of phenotypic testing as well as genotypic testing is several orders of magnitude uh, higher. Therefore, in order to be able to detect the bacteria, they have to be cultured. If we come back to the blood, they are uh, commercial blood culture bottles. They are filled 
uh, with a broth, so with a culture medium that allows the bacteria to multiply as fast as possible. And uh, that takes anyway several hours, it's also automatized. After that, the bacteria have to be separated from the, from the blood. They are diluted on agar plates uh, where in isolated colonies will grow. And these isolated colonies that contain individual types of bacteria then can be identified by mass spectrometry and um, antimicrobial susceptibility testing can be performed. However, this takes uh, hours to days, uh, especially for a complete AST. So, um, the, the first message is actually that, okay, we are able to increase the number of, uh, of bacteria uh, from, the, from the sample to levels to overcome the limit of detection. However, until we know if an existence against a certain type of antibiotics exists, uh, we lose many hours. And as mentioned before, if a blood infection will lead to a sepsis, uh, the time the patient does not have. Okay, in order to reduce the time, there are actually uh, also in the literature many, uh, many, many works uh, where you try to work directly with the whole blood, that you shorten the blood culture and also in the other steps to shorten. And uh, many research works present very amazing times. However, these are very specific uh, problems on the clinical scale, all these methods uh, relatively far away from, uh, from clinical applications. Then there is a second trend, and this is to go away from centralized laboratories with expensive and large, however, very well working systems, to go to point of care so that uh, medicians far from big centers um, can um, make um, an analysis of a blood sample at short time in order to, to decide or to be assisted to decide to prescribe an antibiotic. So in, in our research, we were in particular interested in opportunities of electrochemical sensing to reduce the time to result and also to develop a point of care testing platform. Because as many of you might be aware, a well-known example of a successful electrochemical sensing device is the commercial success of the, of the glucose sensor. So if it's well designed and the system is suitable, uh, it has also a potential for uh, medical applications. And the aspect that we uh, focused on was that viable bacteria uh, have a metabolism that is reducing certain uh, redox active uh, species. And this happens actually in the respiratory electron transport chain inside a living aerobic bacteria. So uh, in this uh, respiratory uh, electron transport chain, actually ATP is, uh, is produced and the electrons are transported from NADH over various uh, redox centers, enzymatic centers, uh, where the final electron acceptor in general is, uh, is oxygen. However, uh, it has been found uh, many, many years ago with, uh, with dyes uh, that there are certain compounds such as resazurine that can enter into the bacterial cell or enter in uh, where it reaches the respiratory electron transport chain and the redox potential is uh, located in a way that uh, it replaces or competes with oxygen um, for the reduction. And the reduced uh, species of resazurine is resorufine and has a different color that can be detected um, colorimetrically. These compounds, uh, they are not toxic for the cells. This is also a very important aspect. And for us electrochemists, it's interesting because these compounds are also electrochemically active and detectable. So here we see two curves uh, that are recorded in electrochemistry using cyclic voltammetry, where we actually see the oxidation and the reduction of, uh, of uh, rizotsurine. If we have a sample without a bacteria, the rizotsurine is uh, not affected, the concentration in the solution is the concentration that we prepare and we get a relatively high uh, current, which is the curve in the, in the black. If we have bacteria in the sample and we let the bacteria react for a certain amount of time with this uh, rizazurine marker, rizazurine will be reduced by the bacteria. So if after a short amount of time, uh, we record uh, our electrochemical signal, and bacteria are present. Rizazurine has been consumed already by the bacteria and the electrochemical signal is decaying. And we can create calibration curves to uh, quantify the bacteria. In order to have 
just the bacteria in our electrochemical cell. We have to separate them from the blood. We do this with magnetic bead-based uh, bead immunoaffinity capturing. So we have the blood sample with the bacteria. We have uh, magnetic beads coated with antibodies specific for this bacteria. We mix everything. We use an external magnet to concentrate the bacteria on the wall of these uh, tubes. Uh, we remove all the blood and other components, and then we insert instead our medium for the electrochemical measurement. One key uh, of our concept is that we have a magnet under the, the working electrode. So the working electrode is in the square millimeter range. It's very small. We work with 20 microliter volumes. And due to the magnet under the working electrode, we have a concentration of the bacteria near the electrode surface instead of having a homogeneous solution as it is used in colorimetry. And this gives us a sensitivity advantage. And we can do this as a very small platforms with uh, multiplied electrochemical cells, uh, works at low cost, is portable, and therefore suitable for point of care uh, applications. The electrodes are very important. They have to be reproducible and sensitive for the markers. And we produce them by using inkjet printing it's a very powerful digital maskless uh, deposition method, and we have actually re uh, replaced screen printing in our labs uh, by producing these electrodes flexibly by using inkjet printing. And a lot of efforts over the years were made uh, to make this process uh, very, very stable with different materials. So in the electrochemical cell, actually uh, the bacteria and the electrochemical uh, system are competing for resazurine. Uh, the more viable bacteria in the sample, the more the signal will decay. However, also uh, we have the problem that the initial concentration of bacteria is low in the blood, and we need to culture them in the, in the blood bottle. And after certain hours, we can see uh, that uh, the electrochemical signal is, uh, is decaying. However, if you compare the electrochemical readout time with the fluorescence time, so here we see bacteria counting curves. Each curve represents a different starting concentration of bacteria. Um, here we see the, the signal decay on the left. On the right, we see a fluorescence uh, intensity increase. These are the different concepts that are compared here. Uh, however, to make the explanation of this graph, complicated graph, very short is if we compare curve number D on the left and on the right, what we can see is so they had uh, identical starting concentrations. And in order to detect them electrochemically, we were in a much, much shorter time range, less than two hours, compared to over uh, six hours in the fluorescent. Concentrating the bacteria on the working electrode, instead of using a homogeneous solution, we had a sensitivity advantage in our electrochemical system. And um, mixing the bacteria with the different antibiotics, we can check whether the bacteria are susceptible or resistant to certain antibiotics. And knowing the concentration of the antibiotics, we can also create um, measurements to identify the minimum inhibitory concentration, uh, the lowest antibiotic concentration that can inhibit the growth of the, of the bacteria. Uh, we have also worked in, uh, in a bit simpler systems, so to develop a rapid electrochemical yes-no sensor, not being selective or specific for the, for the bacteria. And in that case, uh, we have tested different kind of uh, redox active molecules that are known to be reduced by the metabolism of uh, aerobic bacteria. We have, uh, we have compared them in samples that uh, just contained um, bacteria and we could actually see after how much time uh, the signal was decaying and could uh, develop a range of, uh, of suitable redox, media, uh, redox markers for the detection of the, of the bacteria and um, shows, shows quite interesting examples. To go in the direction of, um, of, uh, of real problems, one problem where bacterial infections play a role is that they prevent uh, wound healing, so they create uh, chronic wounds. And uh, certain markers that are um, suitable for electrochemical detection, so it's pyocyanine, it's a molecule here. These are actually produced by bacteria like uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And uh, being able to detect this molecule will allow to measure directly 
on the on the wound the presence of uh, of bacteria and thus of, uh, of a bacterial infection in a chronic wound so we worked with this with the group of greg swain and uh, in order to be able to measure in such complicated matrix like a wound fluid uh, directly on the skin probably in the future in the research we have not done that we have to protect the surface of the of the electrodes in order to avoid contamination and for that we have successfully developed uh, inkjet printing of, uh, of hydrogels in a very reproducible uh, way and um, this is a porous structure that allows to let the pyrocyanine enter but not other compounds in the wound fluid uh, that could contaminate the electrode surface. And actually, we have seen a stability of the sensor um, for a continuous exposure to a, a synthetic wound fluid for up to eight days at uh, 37 degrees. So um, stability here um, was certainly achieved and uh, was a big achievement in the direction of this kind of sensor. Uh, very briefly at the end, um, another option that we have in electrochemistry to study uh, bacteria and bacteria related uh, systems, um, which is um, the study of biofilms that we have recently uh, initiated. Uh, actually, because uh, more than 80% or nearly 80% of chronic and recurrent microbial infections in humans, they are caused by bacterial biofilms rather than individual bacteria. So bacteria are able to form complex uh, three-dimensional communities uh, they produce by themselves an extracellular polymeric matrix. Um, they form gradients of nutrients, of pH, um, different um, mechanisms, actually, that prevent antibiotics to enter and to attack um, the, the bacteria. As a result, biofilms are up to 1,000 times, or the bacteria and biofilms are up to 1,000 times more resistant to antibiotics uh, than individual bacterial cells. And we have grown um, model biofilms, and that's how you usually start, based on, uh, on E. coli. We have made uh, or applied standard methods, uh, fluorescence methods, to identify um, that we have successfully grown a biofilm uh, that consists basically completely only of living bacteria and not of dead bacteria. Uh, we can see in the microscopic images uh, the presence of the bacteria and also of the extra polymeric matrices. And uh, then what we are using for electrochemical detection are very small electrodes, uh, microelectrodes that are made of flexible materials. We have a small uh, carbon microelectrode embedded in, in PET um, that we can bring in contact with very delicate face, uh, surfaces, interfaces like, like biofilms um, in solution. And we can record electrochemical events uh, with this electrode with the resolution in the range of the size of the microelectrode, so let's say something between 25 and 50 micrometer, much larger than individual bacteria. So we are seeing global events, not the event of single bacteria. So what we actually do is when we contact with the microelectrode, uh, the biofilm, we have in the solution um, a redox marker, in that case, uh, ferrocene uh, methanol that we oxidize at the microelectrode, and this oxidized species then is reduced by the respiratory activity of the bacterial cells. Um, the as reduced uh, species of ferrocene methanol is diffusing back to the electrode. The distance is extremely small. It's below uh, two, three micrometer, getting, uh, creating a kind of a feedback loop. So if the bacterial cells reduce the marker, we get a very high current. And if we expose biofilms to different uh, antibiotics and different concentrations over different amounts of time, we can clearly see with the electrochemical signal the efficiency of the um, antibiotics in treating this uh, biofilm. And the difference to standard methods like fluorescence is that the electrochemical method works in a non-invasive way. So the biofilm, apart from the electrolyte solution, is kept as, uh, as it is. So it's a non-invasive way of uh, detecting uh, activity of, uh, of biofilms and the microelectrode can also be brushed over the surface, creating images of uh, biofilm activity. Okay, so uh, I hope that in this uh, presentation I could uh, give a nice overview about some, some recent uh, research works related um, to the development of electrochemical biosensing for the detection of bacteria and antimicrobial 
um, susceptibility testing um, using redox indicators um, that are suitable to detect viable bacteria. Viable bacteria is very important because only, only those are, um, are dangerous. For example, genotypic testing has a problem to differentiate between living and dead bacterial cells. So we are looking at the viable bacteria. And then at the end, I showed you how localized electrochemical uh, methods, like scanning electrochemical microscopy, uh, could provide new opportunities uh, for non-invasive non biofilm studies and analyzing the mechanisms and the defense against antibiotics. The last part was very early research, um, but I think it has a, it has a lot of um, potentials. Of course, apart from the collaborators, I also think the funding that was obtained uh, during the last years. And I thank you again for the invitation and also for, for listening to my, my presentation. I would be happy to uh, reply to any question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andreas. Very, very detailed presentation. Uh, OK, book. If you can detect a uh, antibiotic resistance strain, uh, does this mean their respiratory ETC is different from regular strains? If so, what physiological mechanism defines this difference? Okay, it's a very detailed um, question. Yes. 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 So with uh, with AMR strains, actually you are referring to the to the individual bacterial cells, right? So actually, if we want to just um, identify individual strains uh, with our method, if you want to know exactly which strain it is, you would need to introduce um, a specific antibody against this this type of uh, of strain. If um, it's just to identify if there are bacteria in the, in the solution, um, then, and it does not matter exactly which kind of bacteria it is, just if there is a resistance against these antibiotics. So the information that you would like to obtain is more about the antibiotics, if to treat or not. Um, then you can do that probably also without the, the 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 use of the antibodies that are specific for this kind of uh, of strains <coughs> sorry did it did it answer your question book you can you can activate your microphone right and speak directly uh, thank thank you andreas i was yes. actually mostly uh, curious uh, you, you, you mentioned that there's a difference in the decay time, and that's the key how you uh, detect the antimicrobial resistance strains in your samples. So I'm primarily interested how exactly, like what is the intrinsic marker of, um, of the difference between the resistant and non-resistant? Yeah. Is there really, really any difference in that, in that redox um, reaction or potential? So actually, if we speak about the um, antimicrobial uh, resistance, so then um, it's actually the antibiotic that is affecting the, the bacteria growth. So we are not analyzing the bacteria growth and the metabolic activity together. So let's say the antibiotic treatment is uh, taking place separately from the electrochemical, electrochemical readout was like an in indirect effect. And the comparison that I've shown was actually, of course, uh, let's say the electrochemical readout and the fluorescence readout of the same strain. But different strains will have different growth rates. So um, it's not as, um, let's say, as clear and uh, uniform as it was maybe uh, presented in this way. So um, it's a rather complex, uh, rather complex system. Thank you very much. Yep, you're welcome. I think your microphone is muted, Pierre Andrea. 
<laughs> You're right, sorry, that's difficult for me. Uh, we have a very interesting question from uh, Carmen Junta. Mm -hmm. Would these approaches be amenable to the centralized point of care diagnosis? Certainly, the electrodes seem to be suitable, but it, it, is the same true of the detectors? Probably not the one involving scanning, tunneling, microscopy. The, the last technique, the scanning electrochemical microscope, is certainly just, well, not just, but it's a research tool. So it's, to, it's a tool to, uh, um, to work on the understanding of the mechanisms, on the conditions, uh, on the effects uh, that play a role there. So the, the last part is certainly not suitable for for point of care diagnosis. <coughs> Sorry. Um, the first part, the sensors are, are certainly suitable for point of care. The problem is um, related more to the preparation of the samples. If this can be made in a point of care format. Um, to treat blood samples is not that, not that simple. There are different steps to remove the erythrocytes, to get rid of other materials, to insert them in different liquids. So I see the limitation more in, in that part and not in the, in the application of the sensing and the sensor itself. Ilaria Palchetti is asking uh, if you think that impedance-based techniques can be useful for AST. Yes, I, I think so. So it's a different kind of detection method. So mostly they are based on identifying that bacteria immobilized on the surface, for example, that is changing then the, the impedance of the system. Um, I think so. So many other people work on that. Uh, we haven't made uh, a direct comparison. It's a little bit different concept, but in general, I would say yes. Okay, if we have no other questions, I would like to conclude very briefly. Thanks. Th thank you, Andreas.